Welcome to the broadcast today. I am Kay Matchla, producing director of Media Art Exploration, which we all know, also known as Max. Feel free to call us Max. Um, and I want to thank you all for being here today. Here is a bit of a has become a complicated place in a pandemic. We can't share the three dimensions of space easily, but we but we we can share what has come to be known since Einstein as the fourth dimension. We can share our time. So thank you very much for sharing your time with us. We're gonna talk about, I am sitting in a high dimensional room, a piece of work uh, inspired by Alvin Lussier's I am sitting in a room. And with me today, I have the three collaborators on the piece from around, joining me from around the world. And we are co-presenting this piece with our partner 1014 who commissioned it and we thank them. So Dr. Felipe Orduña Bustamante is with us, a professor and acoustic scientist at the Institute of Applied Science and Technology in Mexico City. It's as a part of the University of Mexico. He explores sound and acoustics through physics to expand what is possible and to explore the boundaries of sound. He plays multiple instruments, including the classical guitar and the Baroque transverse flute. And we have Anina Rubin with us, Luxembourgish German sound artist who explores the presence and effects of sound, voice, and storytelling using computers, high-tech media, and instruments, including her voice. Her works have been shown internationally at the Bundeskunsthal in Bonn, Tate Modern in London, and ZKM in Karlsruhe and conceptual artist Philip Schmidt, with whom I have been acquainted since he joined our Max cohort of artists and scientists at Max Machina last February, and who will present his piece, How Does Thinking Look Like at the Max Neuroverse Festival of Live Arts as soon as coronavirus restrictions lift sufficiently. Um, so Philip is an artist, designer, and researcher based in Brooklyn, New York. His practice engages with the philosophical, poetic, and political dimensions of computation. His current work addresses opacity and imagination in artificial intelligence research. Philip's work is in the collection in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the MoMA Library, and has been exhibited in the US, Europe, and Asia. Philip, we are speaking today about dimensions way beyond the fourth. And would you start by telling us how this project originated and how you entered high dimensionality as a field for research and art making? Yes. Hi. Um, first of all, thanks a lot for having us and everyone for putting this um, event together, supporting us to make this work. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, and yeah, the, the project started for me kind of years ago when I got interested in machine learning as a technology and how um, I came across this um, concept, how information is represented in these models in inside AI, which is fundamentally spatial. Um, and in a, cu a couple of while later, I started interacting with um, researchers at NYU who um, work in AI research. And I realized that they engage with these spaces really intuitively, although it's high dimensional spaces that no one can really imagine. Um, and I thought, well, that's really interesting that somehow this like scientific objectivity is colliding with imagination and something that is really hard to picture. And so I got really interested in ways you could access or experience a thousand dimensional space, a mathematical space. Um, and yeah, I came, I remember the Lucier piece at some point I found, uh, Philippe's work um, online and somehow it's all got rolling and Nina got into the mix and here we are two, uh, two years almost later. <laughs> and what is it that you got exactly from Felipe that started this rolling? Well, yeah, so I, I, I thought we can simulate an echo in three dimensions. Maybe you could do this in more. How hard can it be? <laughs> and so I sat down and 15 minutes later, I realized I have no idea. And I, so I went and looked up if there's like any research where people who actually know this stuff worked on it. And so I came 
yeah, across this paper of um, oralizing reverb in any dimensions. And oh, this is pretty funky. <laughs> and I reached out to Felipe and asked to get like an idea to him to help me with my project. And yeah, okay. coincidence. <laughs> and Felipe, what was it, your math, the mathematicals you delivered, what exactly did they simulate? Well, um, uh, what I can say is uh, that the main idea is that if you imagine yourself uh, in a dressing room um, in front of one mirror and one behind you, 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 you get this uh, sequence of images of, of yourself. And, and in fact, that's a, a mathematical uh, model uh, or method called the image method. And it is used in optics, of course, but it also used in acoustics. And uh, um, it, it just came to me that uh, if you can um, simulate one dimensional spaces, this uh, infinite or unlimited row of images of yourself in a dressing room when, in, uh, when between two mirrors, then you can imagine having uh, two additional mirrors in perpendicular directions, one left, one right. And then you have this two-dimensional array of images of yourself. And you still uh, go on and add a, a mirror on top, mirror on, on, in the bottom. And then you have an, an array of three-dimensional um, uh, images around you. And uh, we, we can stop that uh, there. Uh, in our own imagination, but in mathematical terms, you can just continue adding pairs of mirrors in perpendicular directions. And then uh, that's the basis of the uh, mathematical model that uh, I implemented um, in the computer. Um, in, in my field, I think that of going into the fourth or fifth dimension is quite strange. So I thought that the application would be in art, precisely. And uh, in, in fact, it was a happy coincidence that I uh, published this research in a conference in Finland some th three years ago, and that Philip uh, came to across it. And I think those, that was a very happy encounter. The good thing about the internet positive thing about the internet. Um, and then Nina, so these, math, um, these mathematical models uh, allowed you into this high dimensionality space. And I think of you a little bit as the bridge between the conceptual artist and the, and the um, scientist. So if you're uh, the, the sound designer, sound artist with the engineering capacity, did you find this uh, high dimensional sound space like a playground or was it terrifying? Was it, and did you, could you imagine what it would sound like or was it like sending something into the unknown? So I, um, I was very, very excited when I, when Philip contacted me and um, I was, uh, yeah, I was very excited to see the inputs responses that we used. Um, and when I saw them, I could imagine how it would sound like uh, because the, the visual representation of these resp uh, impulse responses that form the reverb. Well, yeah, when you have some experience with the reverberations and sound producing, you, you kind of get a feeling of how that might sound. But still it was very, um, what was most suspenseful for me was how they would um, sound on top of each other because I've never like added layers and layers and layers of more reverberations, which we did. And so that was a very nice experience. And um, yeah, I, I mean, it was not terrifying. It was more like a playground, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's a little terrifying to think about. It's not terrifying to experience for me, but <laughs> yeah, I, I, love it. I love that you give us that experience of high dimensionality, which we can't really imagine. Our brains are locked in three. Um, yeah, and, but also it was for me, I thought at first, I thought when I read about what Philip wrote me, of when he explained the project, I thought it would be very crazy reverbs that I would have never seen. And I was a little bit surprised also that they still look quite natural. 
because I often I think I had this imagination that a higher dimension automatically means it's outer space. It has nothing to do with the earth here, but it's it's just so very different. And I, I kind of got a little glimpse or a feeling of what actually a higher dimension is just through experiencing the sound of it, that it's actually so close to or exactly where we are and not far away, which I always like thought, oh, that sounds like something from another galaxy, but yeah. Okay, and I wanted, I forgot to say to the audience that the chat is open for you to post your questions for our question and answer at the end. You can also raise your hand at that time and we'll let you ask your questions with audio if you prefer that way. But please, as you think of questions, put them in the chat and we'll come to them at the end. Um, so uh, Felipe, did you apply these models to other, anything besides, what have you, what did you apply these models to before Philip applied them to the high dimensional room? Anything? Uh, well, the, what, can, what comes directly from, uh, from my uh, calculations are what are called impulse responses, so sort of uh, shotgun responses, um, which are perhaps not really very interesting. Uh, it ju just you hear the sound uh, going away as the reverberation fades out. But then I, uh, what I did was I recorded my, my, my own children were um, then young, I think something like six, eight years old. Then I, I recorded them saying hello in Spanish, hola. And, and then I thought, uh, well, um, uh, I, I will uh, uh, process that uh, short recording of, of my kids um, in one, two, three, four, five, and six dimensions that I only have at, the, at that time. And uh, well, the result is perhaps uh, interesting to, to to hear. And um, that, that that's what I, I I did for getting a more sort of natural, so to speak, uh, um, um, sound uh, of, a, of a voice processed processed by by, by these high dimensional loop of responses. So this you applied it to that, and then. So Philip, um, when you, uh, so you, the Alvin Lussier piece also starts with the human voice um, and he starts with his own uh, imperfect voice, which has a stutter. And the voice of the, at the top of the, the voice at the top of high dimensional room is seemingly perfect or sort of no irregularities, sudden shifts or stutters. Um, where does this voice originate? The computer voice? Or is that, that yeah. is the answer, I guess? The, well, it's a generated voice. <laughs> Where would you say that originates if it? Um, I mean, it's not coming from a mouth, right? There's no tongue involved. Uh, it's a, a neural network generated voice in actually from one of these services that tech companies give, give to developers. If you're making an app that should speak, um, you can use this type of stuff. And I assume it is made ultimately from like probably thousands or I don't know how many thousands of hours of people speaking and then training an algorithm to be able to um, do this. And yeah, I, I think how you're saying it, it's interesting because what is what is perfection for that? Um, for so many, t for a long time, like, computer voices were had like a distinct computery character, um, like a robot voice. How we imagine a robot voice sounds like, um, and now at this point, yeah, Siri and Alexa and all these these digital assistants sound almost. Um, yeah, perfect in in this sense, but of course, yeah, like the the human part in that is is is, is gone. And is that contrast between like the Lucier voice and that voice part of your intent? Is is yeah, I mean, um, it, it originally we did not um, get to there or get to this project from this angle, but um, definitely Anina and I had a discussion. Um, about if we 
should try to get the computer voice to stutter, which is actually really not trivial. Um, and also ultimately we decided that the contrast would be there if we don't do it. And that it would kind of be this, that this would be a nicer gesture than trying to replicate it. And yeah, I'm also still very curious about the motivation of the original because Lucie says, um, and it's, I mean, it's obviously the experience of the work is made by the physical space, the echo in the room. But he says in the script, he says, uh, this is not about the physical effect, but more to smooth out my speech. Like he states kind of the, yeah, the opposite right. of what's happening. So I think it's really curious and uh, yeah. Well, as I have listened to this piece several times, it didn't occur to me till the third or fourth time that he, the machine generated voice starts with saying, I am sitting in a high dimensional room. So it's a sort of a existential challenge, if you were, will, because the I is not the self of self as we consider it, but it's the self of a high dimensional, it's being created in high dimension, if you will. So I was just curious if your work in this high dimensionality often circles back around to what is I and self and... Um, I would say no. <laughs> I think the voice is as much conscious as is Amazon Alexa, which is not at all. Um, yeah. So that, ah, <laughs> see, this is what most scientists won't, do not want to define consciousness, but you've just put consciousness between us and Alexa in a way, which as yeah. artists, we're allowed to do, I think. That's what we're allowed to do as artists, I think, create that um, paradigm to a degree, to a degree, but I hope the scientists aren't. I mean, I think there's many, there's different kinds of consciousness, um, but Alexa is not it. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Um, and um, so when you imagine, so I guess what I'm questioning about the artist and the scientist collaboration, when you are, how does this, how do, do the, does this, does the scientist push you, Philip? Does it push your imagination to imagine? Does it push you to be more concrete and grounded like the scientist? How, do, how does the collaboration between artist scientist and artist engineer and Anina work for you? Um, I'm curious what Anina and Philippe are going to say, <laughs> but I think in my experience, often you bring something to this table that is kind of naive and some people, the other people bring something that is for them that is maybe my ex my expertise and from there that angle naive and the naivety is i think often very helpful to think differently about your own work and yeah i think in any case to, together you can more make do more than you can do alone <laughs> as it's in many places in life and felipe how is, has this piece opened up what does the working with the artist and seeing the work that they do with your work, does, what does that affect or resonate for you? Well, this is, for, for me, it is very exciting because uh, I, I didn't have uh, any idea of how these calculations of sound in high dimensions could have been used uh, in art or creatively. I don't have that. Uh, I mean, it, it is not uh, uh, my field. So uh, to see what uh, Philip and Anina did with this was for me very, uh, were, were very enlightening. Uh, when I did publish this work, it was only in a very technical and scientific uh, uh, terms. And uh, I, I did have the idea that the, that the application of it would be in art and perhaps in games, virtual reality, something like that. But I didn't know how. That, that's basically uh, the thing. So I, I am very, very happy to see uh, uh, these methods applied creatively. For me, it has been eye-opening, so to speak and ear opening as well. 
and Anina, how about you as the as I think of the bridge? I think it was very enriching to work in a collaboration. Um, I'm not sure if it matters so much whether the other um, uh, participants are, sci are, are scientists or artists or so, because I think if, like most artists or ev every human being has its own language, his own perspective, his own world and a way to create or express. And so whatever the profession might be of the other party or other collaboration uh, collaborators, I think it will always be enriching in, in, some, in some sort. Yeah, but I think, of course, when we go to a topic that's like the higher dimensions, it's, of course, uh, uh, how, how, do you, how do you say that in English? Inevitable? Like, you cannot avoid it <laughs> to, to have some scientific um, help or push to, to still um, create a work that has a link to how things actually are um, dealt with in science. And can I uh, just ask about the limits of the mathematical model for a minute, Felipe? It, it, it's interesting to me, this whole practice of trying to imagine these high dimensions, the challenge of that. And string theory claims there's 10 dimensions in space, I think. Um, but you seem to be creating, how, like how many dimensions can you create in your models, if you will? Mm, well, uh, right now it can be any any dimension. You name it, one thousand one hundred. In fact, I can even put uh, four and a half in, in, as a parameter <laughs> in, in in my model. But but um, but uh, at, at the beginning, when when Philip first approached me. I had a, a, a very tough uh, limit in terms of computation time, computational time, because as the number of images in the image model, model that I described earlier uh, increases, then for each dimension that you increase, computer time increases by a factor of 10. So if, if you uh, imagine calculating in four dimension takes one second, then in five dimension it takes 10 seconds and uh, then 100 of seconds and then as soon as you get to something like dimension 20 or 30 you begin to need something like the age of the solar system or the age of the universe uh, in terms of computation and time it, it, it's like this history of the invention of chess you remember that that the king uh, uh, wanted to reward the inventor of chess. Then he asked one uh, grain of rice for the first square, then two for the next, then four, uh, eight, and 16. And, and, the, and the king thought it was very little rice, but in fact, no amount of rice could suffice. It's more, more or less the same thing here in terms of computation time. If you calculate a direct um, uh, uh, answer. But then uh, when Philip asked me to calculate in something like dimension 200, I, I thought, well, that is not possible. But then I, I uh, had already devised some approximate uh, calculations, which are based on um, statistical uh, distributions. And um, I came up with this new method that it is not exact, but it, uh, uh, it uh, accurately uh, captures the dimensionality and um, well, ma ma many things uh, uh, statistically. Um, th th that's what I can say about, about it. Uh, and perhaps lastly, I, I have to uh, say that uh, these statistical models uh, are very similar to simple epidemic models that nowadays are very, uh, unfortunately, very popular because of the COVID epidemic. But uh, uh, well, that, that's what I can say about all this, uh, uh, so you, about, uh, about the mathematical calculations. So you kind of did a work, what we'd call a workaround to the problem of the computational time. I remember yeah, the like correct. yeah the 
the first or second email that I sent you, I, I said, can we do your research, but in 1024 dimensions? <laughs> and you said, yeah, it would take the age of the universe, but come back and come back in half a year. And then I did, and then it worked. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a human workaround. That's um, OK. And um, it's really interesting. So we can still work around these machines. There's still a, there's still a lot we have to add to this, to, the, to this with these machines. Um, um, and Philip, does this work in high dimensionality? Um, has this influenced your work when you're talking about the high dimensionality of machine learning or which I, you know, which we can't imagine all these dimensions that they're creating in what we call, I think the black box, but it is this high dimensionality. How has, has, has this work influenced that or? Um. I mean, yes and no, I, I suppose. Um, I think it's definitely, I've been, as I said, I've been looking for ways to imagine this better. Um, and I think where the visual ends, the imagination, the sound experience is really helpful. Um, I think though it suffers from the same, the same problems. Like there's kind of these mental bridges to imagine a four dimensional cube, something like that but you're only experiencing it in, on, often on a 2D piece of paper in the 3D world with your eye and brain. Same with, your, with this work, you're, having, you're in the accurate simulation of a thousand dimensional space, but it comes through headphones in 3D, it's like this way. And so um, in some ways it's, yeah, it shows the same paradoxes of trying to experience something and that is the parallel too with the rest of that field of science, I think that the researchers engage a lot with through diagrams, for example, with the with the work that they're doing, and also a diagram, a two-dimensional drawing of a thousand-dimensional thing in only so many colors. And so there's like all this kind of projections always involved that show how murky it is really is to understand all of these. Wow. Yeah. Thanks. So um, I want to ask, did COVID change this collaboration or influence it or would it have happened without COVID? And when it did happen, was it changed by the pandemic? Well, what, what I can say is that uh, um, um, we all three met only very recently, I, I mean, seeing our faces. Uh, our collaboration was uh, uh, through email all the time. So I think it, 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 it was uh, premonizing something like that, uh, the COVID uh, pandemics, because we, 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 we were um, communicating already on, uh, virtually. Uh, that I found, uh, I find yeah, there is the, the silver lining of COVID might be that international collaborations are slightly more possible. Um, we all have the time for them and, and that, that's a kind of wonderful small silver lining that maybe will continue post pandemic. Um, um, so I thought I would open it up to some questions. Please put your questions in the question and answer. I have a couple here and you're help, welcome to put more. Um, so, uh, with, let me start with, um, could one of the panelists please explain the physical setup of the installation was a specific room used for certain qualities. Was this performed in multiple rooms with different results? Sure. Um, so the, um, the physical setup is easy to answer because there was none. Um, the whole piece was entirely a simulation. Um, so the voice recording was not a recording. It was a synthesized voice um, that never left a computer. And then um, maybe actually Anina can um, speak to the nitty gritty of that um, better and I should let um, her explain the second part. <laughs> uh 
Yeah, I was not. Yeah, I was going to answer it, but I was not done reading the question yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, so on the because I, it's kind of uh, the question has like two levels for me. On the one hand, you have like the actual installation. It's a simul like like Philip said, it's a simulation. But I thought the question was meant of the dimensions, the actual virtual dimensions. So it was uh, I well, we mixed the um, the dimensions uh, around. We went from between two hundred seventh dimension up to a thousand twenty fourth dimension, but it didn't start with, like uh, with the biggest or with the smallest. It really was like jumping from one dimension to another one to another one and going back and higher and smaller. So that was really a mix. We wanted to leave it like natural and not into a, a certain order. Also for the sound of it, um, depending on which dimension was uh, was used, the delay could be really, really strong. And uh, so we also had the intention that it kind of has an aesthetic um, sound uh, sound touch to it so that we can really also under, still understand in the first parts, uh, uh, the voice and that it would not explode directly. So uh, yeah, that was uh, from the technical uh, install, like a virtual installation um, part. Yeah, I hope the, the question could be answered. Uh, I'm, and for the equipment, uh, I mean, another technical part that influenced it, or, or maybe not at all, that Philip also already mentioned, there was this challenge. We were talking about higher dimensions, but we have two ears and it, uh, the piece was supposed to uh, be listened through headphones. And so you have kind of the binaural setup, which can a maximum, uh, the maximum could be a, th a three dimension or a th uh, 360 degree audio experience. So we ended up deciding it's going to be just in mono <laughs> to kind of not um, mess around or not give a touch of a three-dimensionality like we tried to escape the three-dimensionality as much as kind of possible um yeah great okay and um is there a visual component to this as well or any interesting and unusual results found from looking at plotted data points those are so the visual element being the data i think is the question Um, for the most part, no. I think the, the, yeah, we precisely did a sound piece because, um, I've been looking at all these ways of seeing, visualizing higher dimensionality and I've always found them really frustrating. Um, and so this was, yeah, meant to be, uh, audio only, um, and yeah, it's kind of like what I also said, try to say earlier that a data, a, a, a scatter plot um, is kind of only showing so much. Like when you see a map of the world um, that is not a globe, um, things get distorted and suddenly one continent is really large, another one is um, smaller, far away. So um, these kind of, these diagrams lie like any map is uh, in, incorrect, yeah. If the dimensions you're working with are sort of outside of our understanding, how did you know whether the sound that was produced was right or had worked? What were your standards, I guess, or your criteria? I think you talked about that a little bit with me. So that's a great question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to start. Uh, if someone uh, wants to, um, to add something. Uh, so yeah, of course, we uh, had to take a lot of decisions always, okay, do we want to use this dimension now and the other one afterwards or this before and does that sound nice? Uh, one thing that influenced uh, the impulse response a lot um, was actually that we, uh, I mean, we could decide pretty much anything like whether the walls should have, should be out of uh, wood or out of marble or out of other kind of material. So there we kind of still um, try to take impulse responses that would make, I would say, a nice, uh, a nice sound um, 
because it can really get really crazy and very um, sound explos uh, explosive uh, with the wrong, oh, not with the wrong, but uh, different materials that we use in our three-dimensional world where we sit and, and surround us with. Um, yeah. I'm curious, Felipe, how do you know it's right what you did? <laughs> <laughs> Same, the same well, question. Nobody knows. We, we could invite uh, any inhabitant of the 1000 dimension to tell us if we are right or no. But what I can say about this is that uh, in, 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 the, in the mathematical uh, formulation, uh, you, uh, you have uh, precisely the same kind of things that you could use or, uh, in, in calculating reverberation in, in our own world in three dimensions. So as Anina was uh, saying, um, in this uh, method, uh, we have to take in, into account the speed of sound, which in this case is the same as ours, 340 meters per second, something like that. You have to take into account the size of the room um, you have to take also into account uh, how reflective are the walls. And you know, was saying, uh, or you were saying, made of wood or marble or something. Um, and finally, uh, the, the strange element, which is the dimensionality. In, 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 in our own uh, acoustic, uh, applied acoustics uh, work, we, you, of course, use uh, three dimensions. But then you, in this calculation, you have this parameter of the dimensionality. And if I refer back to the this mirror image method, the, 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 the argument I have to, to say that it is correct, it, it is that it, it has taken into account, I mean the mathematical model, it has correctly taken, taken into account how many pairs of uh, uh, mirrors uh, you, you have. And, and that's what I can answer about that. So it's roughly correct because it is uh, a, 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 um, a logical extension of, of what we do in three dimensions and uh, with the same sort of ingredients to the model. There's a lot of interest about the visual representation. There's another question, if there's any visual companion or is it possible to conceptual, concept, concept visually via sound waves? Yes, I, I mean, I, could I, I, be, I mean, yeah. the sound, oh, well, the sound uh, file that we created that is uh, online now that was commissioned, it could, of course, also be a sound wave, like, but yeah, I'm not sure if that is the question. I think people want to see if they can see anything that re it represents it. And it leads me to ask Felipe, do you, your mathematical models, are mathematical equations. Do you think of them as visual representations? Uh, well, the, the, what I can say is that, um, I mean, the, the, there are two elements to this. One is uh, um, visually, trying to visually imagine the, the geometry of the rooms, which is, I think, very difficult or almost impossible, or as Philip was saying, only as uh, perhaps uh, uh, paper projections in two dimensions, it's, it's really, really difficult, I, I think. But the other component is, as Anina was saying, representing the actual uh, wave forms. Uh, and I, what I can say that, for example, the input responses are, or, or the uh, speech, uh, having been combined with the uh, high dimensional input responses. Uh, you can, of course, uh, plot them, but I think they don't look very different from uh, um, normal audio recordings uh, in three dimensions from one in 100 dimensions or something like that. You, you can plot the, the, the waveform, but you don't see the dimensionality there. Uh. Okay, you said, maybe, go ahead. Maybe one other tiny avenue that could, this could go, the question could go is when, so for the original piece, um, when Lucier performed it um, early on, 
he was actually i'm not sure if he did it once or repeatedly but it was he performed it with his wife um, mary lucier who is a video artist and um, while he was doing his thing she um kind of applied the same principle um so she i'm not exactly sure how it worked anymore but i think they had a photograph uh, a polaroid and then took another photo of the Polaroid and another photo of that Polaroid and so on. So there was kind of the same feed feedback loop applied to photography. And yeah, you can, I don't know if you can, but I can imagine that how, this, how this will go. Um, you, you'll find it online. <laughs> okay, we've put in the chat box, the URL to the piece. Um, uh, so I, and there was a question about, can you please describe the feeling of experiencing these sounds? So I'm not gonna answer that in words. I'm gonna suggest that those of you on the conversation who haven't listened, go to the URL or go to either our website, mediaartexploration.org or 1014, and you can link directly to the piece and listen um, with your three-dimensional headsets, but it will take you to higher dimensions. Um, so I want to um, thank you all very much for being here. I want to finish, if we can, with an excerpt. But first, I want to thank you. Um, it's been a real treat to have this conversation with you from around the world in these times about um, the possibilities of exploration when we're a little confined. So I really want to thank you, Philip and Nina and Felipe, for your work and for your time today. And we are going to try the Technology gods are not, we're not with us with the first recording and they may not be with us now, but we'll try once again to, to, to end with an excerpt of the beginning of I am sitting in a high dimensional room. And if we fail at this moment, please go to the URL and experience it for yourself because you really do wanna hear what happens to this voice generated in the high dimensionality of machine learning. What happens to when, it, when it goes into the high dimensionality of space? So I recommend going and uh, we will try now to play it and uh, we will disappear and hear it. And um, thank you um, very much for coming today, you all. And thank you to the audience for sharing your time. And hopefully we will go out with high dimensional room. If not, we go with a mystery. I am sitting in a room extending in many more dimensions than the three you are in now. I am recording the sound of my generated voice. And I'm going to play it back into the room, again and again, until the simulated, resonant frequencies of the room reinforce themselves. So that any semblance of my speech with perhaps the exception of rhythm, is destroyed. What you will hear then,